Isaiah 65, 20 through 25. No longer will there be an infant who lives but a few days, or an old man who does not live out his days. For the youth will die at the age of 100, and the one who does not reach the age of 100 will be thought accursed. They will build houses and inhabit them. They will also plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They will not build and another inhabit. They will not plant and another eat. For as the lifetime of a tree, so will be the days of my people. And my chosen ones will wear out the work of their hands. They will not labor in vain or bear children for calamity. For they are the offspring of those blessed by the Lord and their descendants with them. It will also come to pass that before they call I will answer and while they are still speaking I will hear. The wolf and the lamb will graze together and the lion will eat straw like an ox and dust will be the serpent's food. They will do no evil or harm in all my holy mountain says the Lord. Greetings, friends. Welcome back to the broadcast. I'm Sean. Website can be found at scriptureandprophecy.com. That's where you go to find the archives. That's where you go to support this mission of truth. Today we are resuming our study in 1 Corinthians, and we are ready for chapter 15, which deals with the resurrection. Now, there's some passages that are obvious and easy to understand, and there's some that are a little more difficult and that scholars and commentators have debated about forever. And I certainly don't have all the answers. Um, But we are going to try to do a short little discussion about part of this um, as it pertains to what happens next. Um, and the order of things. And uh, I'm just going to share some thoughts, uh, but not necessarily have all the answers. You'll have to prove yourself and study yourself and those kinds of things and seek God and try to come to an understanding. When When we're dealing with the end and the order of events, resurrection and the millennial kingdom and... Those sort of things. Is this symbolic or is this literal? It's difficult. And we all kind of have to come to some type of understanding. Um, But our understanding may be wrong. Uh, Just like the disciples and everyone of Jesus' day was wrong about his first coming. And what his intentions were going to be. And so, no doubt, uh, we will have gotten some things confused and wrong ourselves in dealing with his second coming and all of that. All right, let's read chapter 15. The first part of it is just dealing with the reality that Christ has risen, and if he hasn't, uh, then our faith is in vain. We're wasting our time, and we are to be pitied above all men. All right, Uh, so let's dig in, and I pray in the powerful name of Jesus that this will bless and strengthen you this morning. Chapter 15, verse 1. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and which also you stand, by which also you are saved if you hold fast the word which I have preached to you, unless you have believed in vain. So please note, just real quick, uh, there's one of those if statements that I often claim that Christians hate to hear. We don't like to hear, do, you know, this is the truth for you if, right? We just want it to be our truth. What does Paul say? He's talking about what you've received, that you are also saved if you hold fast the word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. So maybe your belief isn't really belief at all. 
continuing on. For I delivered to you as the first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. After that he appeared to more than five hundred brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now. But some have fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James, and to all the apostles, and last of all, to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. So Paul's saying, the resurrection of Messiah was not just some fairy tale. He appeared to his disciples, and not only them, he appeared to 500 people, many of whom are still alive to this day as he's writing this. So he's saying, you can go speak to these people yourself. And he also appeared to James. And then last of all, he appeared to me personally. So Paul's making the argument, look, you can try to say this hasn't happened, but we have eyewitnesses endless, and you can go see them for yourselves. Continuing on. So he appeared to me also, for I am the least of the apostles. And not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. So please note, there's one little rant I have to do. One thing I just get so tired of hearing people say is they'll quote Paul about how he's the chief sinner, right? And they'll be, oh, I'm just like Paul, I'm the chief sinner, you know. And they they act like that's some kind of badge of honor. When Paul talks about how he was the chief sinner, he, it's not because he was living an immoral life. He was more zealous for the law of God than we could ever hope to be. When he talks about he's the chief sinner, he's simply talking about the fact that he persecuted the church out of ignorance. He was zealous for the things of God. He didn't understand at the time, and so he persecuted the church thinking that he was doing God a service. So when people are like living an immoral life, and they're like, well, I'm just the chief sinner... You know, grace this, grace that. I'm just like, what are you talking about? That's not what Paul means. In this instance, he's explaining that. I am the least of the apostles. Not fit to be called an apostle. Why? Because I persecuted the church of God. So there's my rant about that. Let's continue on. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me did not prove vain, but I labored even more than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach and so you believed. Now if Christ has preached that he has been raised from the dead, how does some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is also in vain. Moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God, because we testified against God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless, and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. So Paul's saying, if there's no resurrection of the dead, then this is all pointless. Why bother? What value is there in trusting in Christ for eternal salvation if when you die you just become dirt? Right? You might as well just live it up. He's saying, if there is no resurrection, your faith is worthless. And you're still in your sins. And everyone you know that has passed away, is they've become dust. And there's no future. Obviously, though, Christ has been raised. That's his point. Now, here comes some difficult passages. The order of resurrection. Verse 20. 
But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam we all die, so also in Christ we will all be made alive. But each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, after those who are Christ at his coming. Then comes the end, when he hands the kingdom to God and Father, when he has abolished all rule and authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be abolished is death. For he has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when he says all things are in subjection, it is evident that he is expected who put all things in subjection to him. All right, so let's just take a moment again. This is not one of those situations where I'm going to pretend to have all the answers. Obviously, the first few verses are very clear and easy to understand. No problems, right? But Christ has been risen from the dead. That's the good news. He's the first fruits of those who are asleep. No difficulties there, right? He's going. He was the first one to be raised. He fulfilled the feast of first fruits. He is, you know, he is the first fruits of the resurrection. Verse twenty-one says, "For since by man came death, talking about Adam and his sin, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead." The Lord, right? For as Adam, we all die, so also in Christ, we're all made alive. Still easy to understand, no problems. But to each in his own order. So here's the order of events, according to Paul. Christ, the first fruits, that's already happened. After that, those who are Christ, so those who belong to Christ at his coming. So you've got Christ, the first fruits, and then at Christ's coming is the resurrection of those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end, when he hands over the kingdom to God and Father, and he has abolished all rule and all authority and all power. For he must reign until he has put all of his enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be abolished is death. So the issue really depends on your eschatology. Um, because if you believe that Christ is going to return, he's going to set up a millennial kingdom for 1,000 years... Uh, people will still be on the earth um, who are in normal carnal bodies, normal human bodies. And, uh, you know, I read that. Well, or m- many, including many of your old Bible commentators and scholars for the last 2,000 years, have believed that we were in the kingdom of God. And that it would continue to grow and spread out into all the earth until it had conquered the world. Right? It's kind of like that great commission. Go out and make disciples of all the nations. So you have conflicting views about how this plays out. Is the millennial kingdom a... Is it symbolic for just a really long period of time? And then there comes a point when the world rebels once again... And then the end comes? Well, if that's true, then we have to be living in that time of rebellion, right? Because that's clearly what's happened. Or, is Christ going to return when things are, and things have gotten so bad that our only hope is that he would return, and if he doesn't return and intervene, there's going to be no flesh left? Like, So which is it? And that's really for you to try to decide. And it's been debated for since the beginning here's what I can say pretty confidently both scenarios fit that we are ripe for the return of Jesus right return of Messiah if the thousand years is simply a is symbolic for a long period of time and that the kingdom of God has grown and became more known throughout all the earth over this period of time, and now we're in the great deception and great rebellion, and the kingdoms of the world have come against God and God's people again, then the return of Messiah must be near. If this is just uh, the church age, the age of the Gentiles, and when it gets to the point where it's so ridiculous and getting so bad that Christ has to return or there's going to be no flesh left. If that's the case, then we must be close to the return of Christ. No matter what, no matter which one of those theological, eschatolic, 
political uh, point of views that you hold. I think we must be close either way. The reason why I still lean hard towards there has to be a thousand year literal reign before there's the final and full resurrection is because of some of the things that just haven't been fulfilled unless they're just all double speak, you know, unless it's just all symbolic and the for example, the passage that I just read to start the podcast out of Isaiah talks about how there'll be a period of time where there's just like great peace, even a, even amongst the animals, even the lions like eating grass and not a, you know, not killing and no longer are infants dying and people are living to a, to at least a hundred and they're considered children still at that age. And if someone dies, before a hundred years old, it seems as though they're accursed. That scenario has not happened, has it? Or how about uh, in the prophecies where it talks about how the nations will have to come to Jerusalem for the Feast of Tabernacles, and it specifically calls out Egypt and says, if Egypt doesn't do this, then they won't get rain. And like, there's lots of prophecies about that. Or how about how the weapons will burn for like seven years and we'll beat our weapons into plowshares. And there's this great time of peace and Christ rule with a rod of iron. I look at it now and I know that Christ has won, but if this is what the world looks like under, and this mean is, uh, so what I'm saying is, is this, if Christ is fully reigning right now and that the thousand years is just symbolic for a really long period of time, then my question is, is this what the world looks like when he reigns? Does this look like uh, ruling with a rod of iron and righteousness and truth? It doesn't appear that way to me, but hey, I could be wrong. So anyway, there's just a lot of viewpoints here. The point that Paul is making is the order of resurrection, right? Christ first, then Christ, those who belong to Christ, and then when it's all done, Christ will return the kingdom to the Father. He must reign until all of his enemies have been put under his feet. And of course, that last enemy is death. Let me read you just a little bit of commentary. This is coming, this is like John MacArthur's view of this. Um, here's what he thinks. Dealing with, starting with verse 24. Then comes the end, when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, and when he has abolished all rule and authority and power. He says, this third aspect of the resurrection involves the restoration of the earth to the rule of Christ, the rightful king. End can refer to not only what is over, but what is complete and fulfilled. He hands the kingdom to God in culmination of the world's history. After Christ has taken over and restored the world for his father and reigned for a thousand years, all things will be returned to the way they were designed by God to be in a sinless glory of new heavens and new earth. Abolished all rule, Christ will permanently conquer every enemy of God, take back the earth that he created that is rightfully his. During the millennium, under Christ's rule, rebelliousness will be will still exist, and Christ will still have to rule them with a rod of iron. At the end of the thousand years, Satan will be unleashed briefly to lead a final insurrection against God. But with all who follow his hatred of God and Christ, he will be banished to hell with his fallen angels to suffer forever in the lake of fire. So that's kind of his eschatological, eschatological view, of that, uh, view of all that. So... That's a lot to chew on and a lot to swallow, and there's a lot of point of views, and again, I don't try to assume I have them all figured out, but I kind of flushed out a little bit of how I go back and forth with those point of views. Uh, I've wrestled with this a lot the last two years, trying to understand this, because um, there's just there's a lot of pieces 
a lot of pieces to it and there's a lot of viewpoints and I've just been looking at it historically. What have people thought historically and admittedly what people have thought throughout history is not what we, what is the standard thought today? All I can say is come Lord Jesus, come, come quickly. Lord Jesus, come quickly because this world has gone completely off the rails and I'm looking forward to the day when everything is completely and utterly under subjection of God the Father uh, and His Son, our Messiah, and that all enemies have been put under His feet, the last being death. Let's finish up our study, starting with verse 27. For He has put all things in subjection under His feet, But when he says all things are put in subjection, it is evident that he is expected who put all things in subjection to him. When all things are subjected to him, the Son himself will also be subject to the one who subjected all things to him, so that God may be all in all. Otherwise, what will those who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, then why are they baptized for them? Why are we also in danger every hour? I affirm, brethren, by the boasting in you which is in Christ. Jesus our Lord, I die daily. If from human motives I fought with wild beasts at Ephesus, what does it profit me if the dead are not raised? Let us eat, drink, for tomorrow we die. So please note, Paul's still making this point. What's the point? If there's no resurrection, if that's not our blessed hope, what's the point? Like, why have I suffered all of these things for the gospel? If Christ hasn't been dead, then let's li- or raised, let's lit it, live it up. Let us eat, drink, for tomorrow we die. Verse 33, do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Become sober-minded as you ought. Stop sinning. For you have no knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. By the way, to all the greasy gracers out there, what's Paul, what did Paul just? What did he just say? Bad company corrupts good morals. Become sober-minded, as you ought, and stop sinning. For some have no knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. But someone will say, "How are the dead raised? And with what kind of body do they come?" You fool, that which you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And that which you sow, you do not sow the body, which is to be, but a bare grain perhaps of wheat or of something else. But God gives it a body just as he wished, and to each of the seeds of a body of its own. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one flesh of man, and another flesh of beast, and another flesh of birds, and another flesh of fish. There are also heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is one and the glory of the earthly is another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of stars, for stars differ from star in glory. So, also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown a perishable body. It is raised an imperishable body. So he's comparing it to sowing a seed. You throw a seed in the ground, bury it, the seed dies, but then out of it, life. Something completely different, right? A full-on plant. He's saying that's, that's the situation. Your body, like a seed, goes into the grave, but then what comes out of it is an imperishable one at the time of the resurrection. It is sown in dishonor and raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So also, as it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last, Adam, became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, and the natural then the spiritual. The first man is from the earth, earthly, then the second man is from heaven. As is the earthly, so also are those who are earthly, and as is heavenly, so are those who are heavenly. Just as we have borne the image of the earthly, 
we will also bear the image of the heavenly. Now, I say this, brethren, that the flesh and blood cannot cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on immorality. Or, I'm sorry, immortality. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable, and this mortal will put on the immortal, then will come about the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. That is 1 Corinthians chapter 15. That last statement is important because we can argue over these things and debate these things. Well, is there is there a rapture before this, and is that, or is it all just one, or is Christ just returning? There's one great resurrection, and then the judgment, and then this eternal kingdom. We can go back and forth about those things. Is this symbolic? Is this literal? But what are we supposed to be doing right now? Right. As we await the fulfillment of this, and when it happens, we'll see it, and we'll have the understanding completely then. What are we to do in the meantime? Here's what we know for a fact. Christ has been raised from the dead, and so will those who have trusted in him. Those are the facts that Paul was beating home in chapter 15. There is a resurrection. If you've trusted in Christ, you'll be part of it. You'll live forever with God. How it all shakes out is obviously debatable because we've been debating it for 2,000 years. What do we do in the meantime while we wait for the fulfillment of this? He tells you, verse 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. In other words, just continue doing the work of the kingdom. Regardless of what's going on in the world, regardless of your view of the end times, rapture and resurrection, all of that, like how it it shakes out, here's what you know. Here's your purpose. Your purpose is the same as it's been for all Christians throughout all time. Go out into the world. Go into the nations. Make disciples of the nations teaching them to do all that the Lord has commanded. Do the work of the Lord. Do the work of the kingdom. Make that your priority in life. Make that your priority in life. I pray you've been blessed strengthened and encouraged this morning. I hope your hearts have been pierced. I pray that this has caused you to draw closer to God. Thank you for listening. Please can please continue to pray for me and for my family for the podcast. Lots of things happening right now. I'll just put it that way. So could really use your prayer over me and over this work and over my family. I'd greatly, greatly, greatly appreciate it. And if you want to support this mission of truth, you can do that by going to scriptureandprophecy.com, clicking on the support and donate tab at the top. Peace and grace be with all of you, and until next time, God bless.